and welcome to the First United Methodist Church in Madisonville, Tennessee this morning. My name is Leanne Strickland. I'd like to welcome our members and our guests to Studio 1M for our live streaming web worship service this beautiful May 24th, 2020. The First United Methodist Church during this worship service is performing and streaming musical materials that are either in the public domain or permitted under performance and streaming licenses from CCLI. Copies of these license certificates are in the church office. Please go to 1UMCM.com and click on the register attendance link to register your online attendance at this service. If you are watching the recording of this service, please go and record your attendance at 1UMCM.com as well. That's numeral 1UMCM.com. Also, please know that there's a copy of the bulletin on the front page as well as the sermon attached under the Our Pastor link at the top of the page. Sue is still collecting information about our 2020 graduates, so if you have a 2020 graduate in your family, be it middle school, high school, college, technical school, or any other important completion, please send Sue that information so that all of our graduates will be recognized. Remember, the special offering for May is for the Holston United Methodist Home for Children. You may give any time this month. Our collected donations will be sent to them at the end of May. You can make a difference in the life of a child through the Holston Home. Now take a moment, greet your family, your friends, whoever you're with, either virtually or otherwise. May the peace of Christ be with you. And also with you. Good morning. We're glad you're here to worship with us and praise God together, virtually, online, and, uh, and in our hearts and minds. Let us uh, join together in singing our call to worship. This is the day. to us from Psalm 103, one of the great psalms of the Old Testament. Let us share together in a, in a call and response here. Praise the Lord, O my soul, my in, all my inmost being, praise his holy name. Praise, praise the, the Lord, Lord, O my soul, and, and forget, forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your sins and heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit and crowns your life with love and compassion. Praise the Lord, O my soul. Let us join together in singing, Revive Us Again, Revive Us Again. Oh 
We're going to share an affirmation of faith again. We do both Sundays. An affirmation of faith is just the basic outline of what we believe. And this morning, we're going to share from the Nicene Creed that was developed about uh, a little less than 300 years after the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus. It was uh, sort of just a, a slight expansion on the Apostles' Creed, the first statement of faith for Christians to memorize all across the Christian world. The Nicene Creed, let's share what it says. If you're a Christian, if you want to state what you believe, you may remember it as you say this. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in the one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Because we, as, as with the affirmation of faith, we want to remember that our faith is rooted in the days of the New Testament, of the first century. And we carry on the Christian faith ever since then. Uh, William Faulkner, I believe it was, from Oxford, Mississippi, the great author, he said something like, in the South, the past is not really, is not really gone. In fact, the past is not really past. And it's the same with the Christian faith. The truths of eight centuries ago or 14 centuries ago, if they're based in the Bible, they're still true today. So that's why the, the, the Gloria, the Glory to the Father, is a great little chorus to sing every week. We come before the Lord now with our time of prayers and our prayer concerns. Uh, we do want to remember um, Dwayne and Carolyn Peters. Dwayne is back in the hospital, so we ask you to be praying for Dwayne. We also want to be thinking of some others that we've mentioned. You may have seen in the call newspaper from the uh, online now from our, our annual conference, Holston Annual Conference. The Reverend Mark Hicks has returned to the United States recently. He is our organist, Mary Alice Huff's nephew. So keep Mark and his wife Heather in your prayers. He's been the minister, the pastor of the English-speaking church in Prague. Uh, Prague is in Czech Republic. Czech Republic right. Uh, so we ask you to be praying for Mark. He's come back to a very different country than when he left a, a, 
last year. Uh, I'll also be praying for Al Alfred Greenwood's brother Clifton. He lives in Georgia. We've had him in our prayers for some time. He's had cancer and has received treatments. He's he's uh, he's receiving treatments again. So we ask you to be praying for Clifton Greenwood and the family. Emma Tate had surgery this week. She's doing very well. Uh, she's uh, uh, in a nursing home right now. And, uh, uh, I've, I've heard the rumors that she's going to break out of there. Uh, so be praying for Emma. Uh, and uh, continue to pray for Debbie Denton, Heather Jones' mother. She battles with cancer. And remember to pray for Debbie Tucker, who has been just diagnosed with cancer. And... Uh, um, Grant Hamilton had asked, has asked prayers for a friend of his, Jesse Woodby. He's a friend of Grant's and of Grant's families, Gary and Sue, uh, for many years. He had a serious motorcycle accident coming out of Atlanta last week, and he's in the hospital down there. So pray for him if you ask. And remember Alan and Jan Johnson. Alan has had radiation treatments uh, for pain relief this week. And they're waiting test results to see what the next step should be. And uh, also Jan is having her regular follow-up tests this week also. So keep them both in your prayers. Continue to pray for Faye Watson as she recuperates at home after spending over a week at uh, Sweetwater Hospital a few weeks ago. Continue to pray for Margaret and Bob Marshall. Margaret will have another chemo treatment in the days ahead. Uh, pray for, for Dwayne and Carolyn, as I, as I mentioned. And uh, continue to pray for Pat and Howard Harvey. Pat needs a ride to her next cancer treatment on June 1st. So uh, if you might be able to help with that, call uh, Sue or, or, call, uh, or, call, or call, call her, call Pat. Uh, and there's a number in the bulletin, I think. Okay. You no? Know? Um, uh, in, in, in the prayer email. list that Sue sent out. In the email. Yeah, it's in the email that Sue sent out. So. Uh, and remember Pat Mitchell, Janet Tweed's aunt, she's battling cancer. Pray for, for true healing for Pat Mitchell. And remember the family of Marty McGuire. She's the daughter of Doc McGuire, a family doctor in Madison years ago, and a great friend to many people. Remember the family of Marty McGuire. Right, are there any prayer concerns that I've missed? Family of Deke Whitlock of Sweetwater. His mom was a teacher. In Madisonville for many years, so the family of Dickie Whitlock. The family of Vicky Whitlock. Dickie. 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 Oh, Dickie Whitlock. Yeah. I'm sorry. Excuse me. Family of Dickie Whitlock. Yeah. yeah. His remember mom was a teacher here in Madisonville for many years. Yeah. Okay. His mom was a teacher here in Madisonville for years. So remember the family of Dickie Whitlock. All right. This is uh, besides our concerns. We want to continue to pray for all the uh, uh, doctors, nurses, and medical professionals who are trying to keep us all safe in, uh, in hospitals and, and towns and cities all across this country, and for that matter, all around the world. Um, I want to pray for them, especially as uh, uh, states and cities around this country open up and, and from the kind of shutdown that we've had are slowly mostly cautiously opening up. Um, this is Memorial Day weekend, the unofficial start of summer. And we want to remember, of course, all those who gave their lives in defense of this country over the years. Let us uh, bow our heads and hearts, Lord. Go to the Lord with our prayers this morning. Let us pray. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, O Lord, on this Memorial Day weekend, help us to remember with deepest gratitude those men and women who so bravely served this nation in times of war and danger. We especially pray this morning for the families of those who lost their lives in defending this country, and for the families of many Americans who lost their lives in our wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. Lord, we pray your divine blessing on these families. Show your love to them and to us, that we may be ever faithful to you and to this great nation. Give to us the faith to love generously, to live boldly, to proclaim your good news boldly in our words and in our deeds. Let us follow the example of Jesus, who was so bold he risked everything, even his own life, to lead us, to save us, and to teach us how to live as his disciples. We lift up to you, O Lord, our concerns.
We pray for this nation and for this world as we continue to battle this coronavirus. Uh, Lord, we pray that you will give your strength, wisdom, and unfailing grace to the health workers and doctors, nurses, medical professionals who risk their lives with this virus in order to provide medical care for the rest of us. And we pray, Lord, that you will give wisdom to the medical doctors and researchers who are seeking for a vaccine. In recent days, we've heard a couple of uh, good potential possibilities for of course, the vaccine is still six to eight months away or, or more. And so we pray, Lord, for that and for the plasma treatment that, uh, that might help, that has helped some people who already have contracted the virus. Lord, we pray for your grace and mercy to comfort and to give strength to all those in need, especially those who are so hurt uh, in this coronavirus, those uh, minority populations who often are the people who are on the front line of providing the, the basic and the essential needs that we all have for food and, and uh, are working in the food chain to continue to carry food into grocery stores around the country. We pray, Lord, as well for those who have already been marginalized in society, those who are having, who've been, have, have been having a hard time making it through life before the coronavirus epidemic hit and now are even in more dire straits. We pray, Lord, for uh, food pantries uh, like the Good Shepherd Center and all those uh, nonprofits who strive to help those who are having a hard time putting food on their tables. And we pray, Lord, that you will bless these food pantries, bless the Good Shepherd Center, and bless those who give generously to support those uh, those agencies and those nonprofits who provide for so many in need. Lord, we pray for your grace and comfort, the comfort of your Holy Spirit to be with those who have lost loved ones in recent days and weeks. We pray especially, Lord, for the nearly 100,000 people who have died because of complications of the COVID-19, the coronavirus illness. We pray, Lord, for them and for their families and loved ones who are left uh, without their uh, husband, wife, grandfather, grandmother, or, or, or whoever uh, has passed away. We ask, O oh Lord, that you help us each and every day to be mindful of these persons and many others of all the prayer concerns that we have shared. We ask, O oh Lord, that each and every day you will help us to pray about these and other concerns to lift them up and bring them before the throne of grace, even as we remember our Lord Jesus taught his disciples to pray. And, and Jesus, you teach us to pray with the words, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now you might want to get your children or grandchildren to gather around the screen. We're going to sing a hymn and then we're going to have a, a few moments with the children. Our next song is Take Time to Be Holy. It's number 395 if you happen to have a hymnal at home. Otherwise, you look through the screen.
young people, if you will. I want to share a couple of quick Bible verses with you. Uh, in Psalm 34, verse 19, it says, The good person does not escape all troubles. They have them too, but the Lord helps them in each and every one. And then from Psalm, from Proverbs 18, verse 10, it says, The Lord is a strong fortress. The godly run to him and are safe. Guys, did you know that today should be the running of the Indianapolis 500 auto race, the 104th running of it? They started in 1916. Now, they postponed it till August because of this coronavirus epidemic. Uh, but uh, uh, it got me thinking, that, have you ever watched an auto race on TV? Well, they're exciting, aren't they? But they can also be dangerous. Those cars driving so fast around an oval track, nearly 200 miles an hour. But they prepare the cars themselves. And in recent years, not only they prepare the cars, but the special clothing that the drivers wear, all of it to protect against accidents and fires. And they have pit crews, men and, and women now, who change tires, fix car problems, and fuel up the cars so that the drivers can race a little more safely. But you rarely see the pit crews, and you can't see the safety designs in the cars and clothing unless an accident happens and a, and a driver just walks away almost unscratched. In fact, there was something like that two or three months ago in NASCAR, in the NASCAR race. And the driver spent about four days in the hospital, came out. Uh, his wife videotaped him walking out of the hospital with his two little girls by his hands, unscratched. Well, you know, the Lord is like that with us. We don't often see the Lord's protection of us unless troubles come. Then it's like the verses from Psalms or Proverbs said, the Lord is with us to help us and to give us strength. Well, let's pray. Almighty God, we thank you that, that uh, like uh, race cars and, and the race car driver's outfits, you prepare behind the scenes to take care of us when troubles come. You look after us to give us strength and give us help. Lord, help us always to remember that you are with us even in difficult times, even when troubles come. That you will be with us. You will show us your love, give us your strength, and give us your guidance. We thank you for your love and grace in so many ways. We ask this and pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Now, you remember that uh, that we've got uh, children's bulletins that are saved up for each one of you and uh, and we've got uh, treats saved up as soon as we can start worshiping together everybody's going to start getting these so we look forward to that may god bless you all right uh at this time we want to remember that the lord is with us each and every day, whether we feel it or not. Uh, and he asks us to serve him gladly through our giving as, as much as anything, or at least with our giving also. Um, now, we've mentioned the last eight, nine weeks, what have we been doing this, ten weeks now, uh, with uh, our, our online worship. And there are there are several ways that you can give to the Lord's work at First United Methodist Church in Madisonville. You can mail your check to the church. Just address it to First United Methodist Church, P.O. Box 157, Madisonville, Tennessee, 37354. Or you can uh, uh, just contact uh, Reba or contact the church office. We're often here on Wednesday mornings for a while. Uh, but uh, just call ahead and maybe you can drop off the check either at the church office or Reba or you can bring it by the parsonage at 111 Philpott Drive. Um, or you can look online. That might be the easiest way. Just look online at the website 1umc1.com. I got it right? 1umcm. 1umcm. Com. Don't let me get that wrong. 1UMCM.com. You can find the church website. 
and it will give you directions on how you can get it. Now let us pray. O oh Lord, bless these gifts that are given today and this week for the work of Jesus Christ in this church and around the world through missions, through the host of home for children, and through the many and various ministries that we offer through our church and through our denomination, through the host and conference. Lord, we pray that the work of Jesus Christ might continue to go on and that the gospel might be preached and shared and taught and lived out on every continent, among every kind of people, speaking every kind of language, that the world may know that there is hope, there is forgiveness, there is love, and there is salvation and eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. For we pray in his name. Amen. All right. Um, this time... I want to share with you uh, from the Gospel of Matthew. I said uh, back back in December that we were going to be looking through through the Gospel of Matthew for the next number of weeks. Uh, and uh, today we come to a chapter which, quite frankly, a lot of United Methodist pastors kind of shy away from. And uh, I don't preach on it very much myself, but... We are looking through the Gospel of Matthew, and this and the next chapter, 25, are very important chapters in what Jesus taught in his last week of earthly ministry before he was betrayed, tried, crucified, and then was raised on the third day. So from Matthew chapter 24, I'm going to read the first eight verses in verse 14, and then we'll refer to a couple other verses. Uh, as we look at what Jesus taught in this chapter. In, ch in Matthew chapter 24, starting in verse 1, As Jesus came out of the temple and was going away, his disciples came to point out to him the buildings of the temple. Then he asked them, You see all these, do you not? Truly I tell you, not one stone will be left here upon another. All will be thrown down. When he was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately, saying, Tell us, when will this be, and what will the sign of your coming in the end of the age? Jesus answered them, Beware that no one leads you astray. For many will come in my name, saying, I am the Messiah, and they will lead many astray. And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not alarmed, for this must take place, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famines and earthquakes in various places. All this is but the beginning of the birth pains. And then in verse 14, Jesus said, And this good news of the kingdom will be proclaimed throughout the world as a testimony to all the nations, and then the end will come. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Almighty God, our gracious Lord, we thank you and praise you for this privilege, this opportunity to come and worship you and praise you together this morning here at First United Methodist Church in Madisonville and, and in our various homes and wherever we can pick up this broadcast. We ask, O oh Lord, that you bless us with your Holy Spirit. Lead us and guide us as we look into your word for a moment. And as we live out our lives today and every day this week, help us, Lord, be your followers, your disciples, and your servants. Help us to know your blessing, Lord Jesus, and help us be a blessing to others for your sake. And may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts together be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. If you knew the hour and the day that the world would end, would you tell anyone? Well, I was brought up at First United Methodist Church in Peoria, Illinois, went through confirmation, and I believe all the things that I was taught, all the things my mother had taught me over the years, but it wasn't until my senior year of high school that I began to take a little more seriously what Jesus talked about. And and some of my friends encouraged me to read the book, The Late Great Planet Earth by Hal Lindsey. It sort of scared me. 
worried me. And as I began to study it, and then at the age of 19, after I gave my life to Christ when I was in college, I began to study this passage, Matthew chapter 24, and uh, a couple of the other passages in the New Testament about the return of Christ. And uh, over the years, I've come to realize that there's been a lot of misunderstandings about what Jesus said and preached and taught. I want to take a few minutes this morning and sort of try to clearly say what he taught and kind of make it simply true what he said. Well, let's look at what he said. First of all, in the verses I just read from uh, chapter 24, verses 1 through 8. Jesus foretold the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem. What Jesus foresaw actually took place in A.D. 70 at the hands of the Roman legions. Now, this sounded like apocalyptic forecasting. And, and, and so the disciples, their curiosity kind of peaked and... and uh, they were wondering, they asked Jesus when the end of the world would come. So Jesus wanted to spell out for them some of the definite warning signals. First he said, watch out for false messiahs. In verse 5 he said many will be deceived. In verse 6 he said there will be wars and rumors of wars, but there's a way to go before the end. In verse 7 he said famines, earthquakes, they're still only at the beginning of the birth pains of the second coming. Second thing he said was watch out for persecutions. In verse 9, he talked about believers being persecuted and put to death. Now, the truth is, this has happened at various times and in various places in the history of the Christian church for almost 2,000 years. 30 years after the resurrection of Jesus, as the Christian faith spread rapidly throughout the Roman Empire, Emperor Nero decided to pick on the new and growing minority in Rome, scapegoating the Christians for all sorts of things that were wrong in Rome. When the city caught fire, Nero blamed the Christians. Many Christians were caught in Rome, and Nero had dozens of them dipped in wax and burned alive to light his garden. Horrible, terrible thing. But those persecutions ended a long, long time ago. What about persecutions in more modern times? Well, we know that that long ago in communist Russia where Vladimir Lenin believed that religion is the opiate or the drug of the masses, Christians were often persecuted. There's a story from a few decades ago of two Soviet soldiers who broke into an evening church worship service and there were several dozen people in there and, and, and they told everyone to leave or they would be shot for their faith. About half of the believers present got up and left. And then the soldiers locked the doors behind the last to leave and turned to those who stayed and said that they, the soldiers, were also Christians, but it wasn't safe for soldiers to, in an officially atheistic state to admit to being Christians. They hoped that those willing to die for their faith in Christ would be willing to keep the soldiers' secret faith to themselves and pray quietly with those soldiers which they did. Persecutions, false prophets, increase of wickedness. Jesus said that would just be the beginning of end things. The sort of trigger for the end of time is in verse 14. As I read Jesus' insights here of all the signs in the book of Revelation and the Old Testament book of Daniel, and whatever some people try to point to to define the end of days, this sentence from the lips of Jesus is to me the best and clearest indication of when Christ will return. When this gospel will be preached in all, the whole world as a testimony to all nations. Has this gospel been preached yet in the whole world? Well, it depends on how you define the whole world. Yes, it, the gospel has been preached on every continent. I suppose it's even been preached on Antarctica, you could say, since there's no permanent human population down there. There's just a couple of science stations, but uh, some of the scientists have been Christians, maybe are Christians, who are down there now. Um, the only permanent residents in Antarctica are the penguins, and I'm not worried about preaching the gospel to them. I think God has a good plan for them. 
But what Jesus said here uh, is in the in the Greek New Testament, what he said was the inhabited earth. That's the Greek word oikomene. Oikomene it means the inhabited earth. And that's wherever human populations are, in Asia, in Africa, North South America, Europe, Australia, anywhere. And mission experts tell us that almost one half of the population of the earth still has never heard a credible explanation of the gospel of Jesus Christ in their own language. Now, if they hear the gospel preached in English or Spanish or some other kind of trade language that's commonly known, that may not make much sense to some people in some faraway lands. So we still have, I believe, a ways to go in preaching and sharing the gospel to all the people on earth. Jesus went on in verse 5, verse 15 to talk about being beware, beware, watch out. He talked about the abomination that causes desolation in verse 15. Well, what is the abomination that causes desolation? Well, actually, something like that had already happened 150 years before the birth of Jesus. You remember the stories you may have heard in, in studying history in school about Alexander the Great, and he conquered uh, much of, uh, from Greece all the way, Western Asia to, to the northwest side of India, uh, conquered all of Western Asia about 330 years before the birth of Jesus. After his death, Four of his generals divided up the Greek empire of Alexander, and each of them ruled a section of it. A guy named General, General Seleucid controlled Western Asia, that was what's now Turkey, Asia Minor, and kind of parts of Palestine and all. And other generals controlled areas like uh, uh, Egypt or Persia that Alexander had conquered. Well, in 168 BC, Antiochus Epiphanius, by the way, his name in Greek meant the glory of God, seeing the glory of God. Antiochus Epiphanius had a bit of an ego problem. Anyway, he was one of Seleucid's descendants. He conquered Israel and entered the temple in Jerusalem, entered the Holy of Holies, set up an altar to Zeus, and some say he sacrificed a pig on the altar to Zeus. An incredible sacrilege and offense to Jewish people. Jesus said that something like that was going to happen again. What do you do when the end is near? Jesus said, what you do is run. In verses 16 to 22, he talked about Christians running, fleeing, getting away from the persecution. And actually, Christians followed Jesus' instructions here in A.D. 70. When the Roman legions were threatening Jerusalem, Christians ran to the mountains that are known as the Transjordan Mountains, where Pella is located. If you ever saw the movie Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade, near the end of the movie, they show one scene from, uh, from the valley in those mountains where actually a Christian church was built into the side of the mountain a couple centuries after this. But that's where Christians first fled AD 70 when the Roman legions threatened Jerusalem and the Romans destroyed the temple at that time. So Jesus said when the persecution of those who hate Christianity comes, flee. And again he warned in verse 23 and 24 of false messiahs. He said as lightning is visible Jesus was telling us that the return of Christ, the return of the Son of Man, will not be a secret. Everyone will know it. Verse 28, he says, the vultures will gather. That meant that it's a gathering of vultures clearly showed the location of carrion, of dead animals to be eaten. The coming of Christ will also be obvious. So when some people have said that the, the secret return of Jesus they're disagreeing with what Jesus himself taught. And then in verses 30 through 35, Jesus talked about the Son of Man. He said he will literally, visibly, physically return in the skies. People will see him. The earth will mourn, he said. 
This is also described in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16. The apostle wrote, For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. And also we read about it in Revelation chapter 19, verse 11, when it says that, uh, that uh, the Son of Man will ride on a white horse. And written on his thigh will be the words, King of kings and Lord of lords, and he will conquer evil. They all testify that Jesus will collect the elect of believers and followers. Well, how have Christians interpreted what Jesus said over the years? Well, in the first couple hundred years after the resurrection of Jesus, they pretty much took all that Jesus taught here in this chapter at face value. And they were looking forward to the return of the Son of Man on the clouds of glory. And over the centuries, Christians have looked at it in different ways, but many of them have interpreted it. Now, starting about a thousand years ago, as, uh, as the world was approaching the beginning uh, of the, the end of the first millennium, the, the year 1000, there were a lot of stories, a lot of people, a lot of preachers who were preaching that the end of the world was near, Jesus is returning in time. Of course, they were wrong. And every century since then, it seems like people would preach that and come up with all kind of convoluted explanations about how events in the current history are, are mean that Jesus is going to return next week or next month or something like that. They've all been wrong. Interestingly, one guy... Uh, said that it's not exactly like that. St. Augustine, the Bishop of Hippo in, in a country that's now Tunisia in North Africa, he was born about 300 years after the death and resurrection of Jesus, lived into the early 400s. He became a, a great preacher, a great uh, uh, Bible scholar, maybe the most brilliant Bible scholar and theologian since the Apostle Paul. He finally concluded after years of studying this chapter and the book of the Revelation and other parts of the New Testament and all, he finally concluded that the return of Christ described here was essentially a personal spiritual event, not to be taken literally. I like a lot of what Augustine wrote. I've read several of his books or parts of them. And I like a lot of what he wrote, a lot of what he said, a lot of what he preached and taught. I don't entirely agree with him here. But you have to admit, it's been a long time ago that Jesus talked about his return. In the last few verses of the chapter, uh, in fact, uh, starting at verse 36, Jesus said, But about that day and hour no one knows, either the, neither the angels of heaven nor the Son, but only the Father. For as the days of Noah were, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. For as in those days before the flood they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day Noah entered the ark, and they knew nothing until the flood came and swept them away. And so too will be the coming of the Son of Man. Jesus said that, that the return of the Son of Man will come in a way that we don't expect. We're not looking, that, that most people are not looking for. So when is Jesus going to return? Well, it's kind of like the old gospel song. Nobody knows but Jesus. Jesus said in these last uh, last paragraph or so of this chapter that, uh, that a lot of things that we might think will point to his coming will not. It will happen suddenly, as he says in verses 40 to 41. The important thing is to keep watch. Be ready. The Son of Man will come when you do not expect it. And then in verses 45 to 47, he told a parable of a wise servant and a wicked servant. The wise servant, while the master was gone, kept everything in place. Took care of everything in the master's household. Was faithful and a good leader. Wicked servant was partied and wasted money and didn't care. And when the master returned suddenly at midnight, he wasn't ready. Jesus said, 
let us all be brave. Now, I mentioned that uh, by my senior year of high school, several of my friends made decisions for Christ during my junior and senior year of high school. Mike Fay was one of them. We played trumpet together all four years through high school, Mike and I did. Uh, we often played the same piece. Sometimes he was uh, uh, a little ahead of me. Sometimes I was considered the better trumpet player, but we were good friends. One summer evening before our senior year started, Mike came by my parents' house to talk to me about the return of Christ. As we sat in the classic 1970 Mustang his parents had bought for him in the dark in front of my parents' house, Mike told me that even though Jesus said no one would know the hour or the day, God had revealed to Mike the month and the year. And the month was August, and the year was many years ago. The problem with the return of Christ for a lot of people is that Christians have been predicting, trying to predict the return of Christ for centuries. Like I said, for about a thousand years. And so far, every prediction has proven wrong. Some of you built up little uh, denominations or, uh, you would say, heretical or alternative views of Christianity, like the Jehovah's Witnesses. They're all wrong, too. You cannot predict it. Jesus tells us that the lesson, really, of chapter 24 comes down to this simply. Be ready. Be ready. Be faithful. Follow Jesus each and every day. Faithfully love others. Be good to others. Take care of others. Reach out with the love of Christ by what you do and the words you say. Help people know that Jesus offers them, will give them forgiveness, love, and eternal life. Just live out the Christian faith each day and let Jesus worry about when he's going to return. Thus endeth the lesson. Let's pray. Almighty God, we give you thanks, we give you praise that you have given us the assurance that heaven is the place that you are prepared for all of us for eternity. It's not something that we can earn by the good deeds that we do. It's something that you give us as a, as a gift out of your all-encompassing, unlimited love. Lord Jesus, help us to walk with you and serve you and be your disciples each and every day. We thank you and praise you. I ask this in the name of Christ. Amen. Our last hymn this morning is going to be uh, We Have a Story to Tell to the Nations. Let's sing this together. Oh. 
now receive the benediction. May the grace of God Almighty, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, be with you now. Bless you. And may he help you be a blessing to others for the sake of Christ. Amen. Bless you all.